So our next speaker is Ryan Davis. Um, I was really excited about, once we put him on the schedule, introducing him. Because how do you introduce Ryan Davis, right? Um, so I got a little circle of the I missed that joke, you said? Carefully. Um, I, I can exit fast. So um, Rails 1 dropped five and a half years ago, something like that. Um, I lived in Salt Lake City at the time, and uh, Eli Duke, who's sitting back there, he and I had made several websites in PHP and MySQL, and we had this feeling that, you know, like that wasn't right, like we didn't really know anything about programming or other languages to know what wasn't right, like what we didn't like. And uh, we were about to embark on rebuilding the site that we built a few times, and I saw the, the blog in 15 minute screencast. And I was like, oh, this Rails thing is awesome. Let's learn a whole new thing when we rebuild this website. And then a month later, um, he and I and four of our good friends moved up here to Seattle. We started a house together. And we built a site. It was like my first Rails project. And it's just adorable kind of to go back and look at. <laughs> uh, I'll gist it up sometimes. It's the hilarious, most hilarious models. And uh, like a month after that, he was uh, building a, a list-making site called Lister List. And we've rebuilt that basically with every version of Rails. Um, and so we went to, we were having some problem that we couldn't figure out because we knew fuck all about anything. And we went to uh, Seattle RV when it was at Red Line Pizza. Is that what it was yeah. called? And uh, Inky.net was giving a presentation about YAML and there was like uh, the functional group and we were like, what the hell is this Ruby thing? And why do they care about? Why is that guy's name a URL? Why does it have Unicode in it? And um, and then like, that's kind of weird. We came back the next week, and that you know that's when CLRB used to be once a month there were presentations or microconf, and then the rest of the weeks were just hack night. And we came back the next week, and it was like Jeff and Ryan and Eric, and later we would meet Evan and you know John Barnett and Aaron Patterson. I remember that the first time we came back, we were like, we've got this problem, I don't even remember what it was, and we need some help, can you take a look at it? And the first thing Ryan said to us was like, your code is shit, just delete it, that sucks. <laughs> and that's sort of been the, the ongoing relationship we've had for years. Um, but, you know, we've always gotten better for it. And I mean, we knew, we basically knew nothing about Active Record, and we were just doing five by sequels for everything. He was like, he showed us the dynamic finders, and we were like, <laughs> find by this and by that, but how? Whatever. So um, we met Ryan and Eric, and they really shaped us in the early days of learning the Ruby and the Rails. Um, so this has nothing to do with that. Ryan Davis. Long tangential stories. Um, <laughs> so, I'm going to talk today about size doesn't matter or the ins and outs of mini tests. I just want to say right now that despite the innuendo, that this talk is Gussie approved. Um, so, a tiny amount about myself. Uh, I'm one of the founders of CLRB. Um, my email address is there, my website is there. I've been doing Ruby for almost 11 years now, hit October of 11, and I've got 84 slides doing 30 minutes, so we have to keep up and the timer is not running. Um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, what is Baytest? Um, it's a replacement that I wrote for Ruby 1.8 uh, test unit, uh, because it scared me. Uh, it was originally 90 lines of code. Um, it has since grown into essentially three test frameworks in one, and it's considerably more than 90 lines, although a lot of that has to do with the fact that we actually documented our code um, this time. <laughs> um, it is uh, available as a gem, and if you have Ruby 1.9, you already have it. It does ship with Ruby. Um, the test unit that ships with Ruby in 1.9 is a wrapper around mini tests that provides some of the old functionality that we didn't want to implement. Uh, it's meant to be small, clean, and very fast. Um, and it provides a lot more than test unit did. As I already insinuated, there's three test frameworks in there. We're going to go into that. So there are six parts to the mini test. There's the runner, which 
nearly every test framework has. It's just the engine that picks things up and, and does the work and then reports the results afterwards. Then there's unit tests, specs, mocks, uh, something called pride, um, and bench. So the runner, uh, very simple system, it's exactly how a test unit works. It picks up all subclasses of test case and runs everything that starts with test. That's it. Um, the design uh, mandates that there's uh, almost no magic allowed. Um, it even avoids the regular object space mechanism to find test classes. Um, we did this in order to bootstrap Rubinius's tests. Um, we wanted to have uh, the cleanest, simplest thing we could have to get, uh, at the time, very partial implementation of Ruby up and running tests. Um, minimal metaprogramming, and it just uses plain classes and methods to do all work. It provides test randomization by default to prevent uh, test order dependency issues. Um, we have flushed out a lot of bugs by doing this. Um, a lot of people will inadvertently write tests that have to run in order for them to work. Um, and if you run one or you run them in a random order, they'll break. And those are bad tests. Uh, every single test should run in isolation and pass. Um, verbose mode prints in a uh, sortable format so that you can find the slowest tests uh, in your test suite. And you'll notice that I am using the advanced notion of pipes. Um, <laughs> sort uh, dash K2, the second field, separated by equal signs. Um, sort numerically and in reverse so the biggest is at the top. And grab the top three and those methods hit that. And then Test summary provides uh, useful statistics. It'll tell you the test per second that you're running and the assertions per second that you're running. And we use this across our projects to see where we should spend our time uh, profiling. So let's talk about unit tests. Here is a very simple example, nothing special to it. Um, we have a test thingy. Uh, we have a test called do the thing. We assert equals 42, thingy do the thing. It is a simple subclass, and it is a simple method. That's it. It's magic free. So that's not much. So what, what assertions are available in any test unit? We have positive assertions and negative assertions. Um, we have everything that you would expect to see, almost everything you would expect to see in test unit. Um, and then the bolded assertions are those assertions that we've added uh, that are new to test unit. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go into detail on all these. They are well documented, uh, easy to look up with RI, or you can look them up online on hard.org or whatever. Um, and assert equal is italicized. I'm going to go into the differences of assert equal. Assert equal now diffs. For simple object differences, uh, you'll just simply see something aligned that says expected, and the expected value, and the actual, and the actual value, and you can just see that side by side, and that's fine. For anything more complex than that, something that has multiple lines or complex structure or whatever, where we deem it important, we actually pass the results through diff and show you a unified diff so that you can focus in on the parts that are different. Uh, this has saved us hours, countless hours. Um, and we are using this new assert equals to replace the unit diff pipe tool that ships with uh, Zentest because it's ghastly. It's much more efficient for us to do this at a certain goals rather than uh, trying to filter the output. On the negative assertion side, we have a brand new complement of negative assertions that you just didn't see in testing it. Uh, things like refute and delta, um, refute includes, uh, etc. Um, again, I don't have time to go into these, but uh, they're mostly self-explanatory. Um, and then we have utility methods. Um, skip. We can now skip things in, in test unit, or any test, sorry. Um, well, test unit 1.9 as well. Um, flunk as usual. Um, a new one that I really, really like, came over from Zentest called Capture.io. Takes the block, returns the standard out and the standard error. Um, and then I've wrapped those up in assertions for assert silent and assert output to make it a little cleaner. And then we have these uh, ugly names, MU uh, PP uh, methods, um, that are for customizing how uh, differences should be output uh, in the cases of like assertions. So why all these extra assertions? It's because it's, it's more expressive. It's enriching our testing vocabulary and helping make our tests more self-descriptive. 
Uh, as you can see, um, we, you know, you look through a regular test and you see a lot of assert nots. Uh, now we can just simply say refute. Um, and then something that you couldn't do in test unit without writing it yourself, um, you used to be able to um, either use your own string IOs and wrap up IO or use capture IO from Zentest. Now you can simply say assert output, <coughs> run a block of code, and know that it output what you expect. So the question that I hear a fair amount is where is assert nothing raised? This is a usual tirade for me, so you may have heard this before but I've reformulated it. It is the same place as refute silent. In refute silent, we can infer from the name that this block of code must print something, but what it is, we don't care. So that assertion is of no value to us. It's, it's not doing anything other than, yeah, something was output. Of course, that output could be a crash, it could be anything. Um, what you should be doing is you should be asserting for this specific output that you need. In the same sense, Certain nothing raised says that this block of code must do something, but what it is, we don't care. Um, so that value, there's no value in that assertion whatsoever. And instead, you should be asserting for the specific result that you need. This code, with nothing in the block, passes. It's clear that it does nothing for us. In the same sense, this code simply calls do the thing, but that method might be empty. This passes its assertion, and people are going to count that as a pass, and it's useless. So what you should be doing instead is this. If do the thing raises, every test framework out there says that an unhandled exception is an error. It's already implied in the contract. We use assert equal to assert that do the thing returns 42, and therefore we have tested the behavior of the method, and we know that it's doing the right thing. So let's move on to specs. Here's an equivalent example of specs. It, line for line, is almost exactly the same, except that we're using BDD uh, language. We're describing thingy, it must do the thing, thingy do the thing must equal 42. And the nice thing about the way many test specs are written is it uses simple reflection to transform the previous example into this example where it is a simple subclass, a simple method, and there is no magic. We have a full complement of positive expectations mapping one-to-one -to, -one to the assertions. Negative expectations map one-to-one -to, -one to the negative assertions. That's all free because must equal is assert equal, won't equal is refute equal, etc., etc., etc. We get all of that through simple code reuse, simple reflection, and that's it. Minitest mock was written as a 15-ish line example from Stephen Baker. I think that's about right. It might have been closer to 10. Uh, as a proof of concept that mock frameworks that were available today are bloated and complex. It's grown up to be a whopping 50-ish lines now. Um, and here's an example. Minitest mock new. We expect that the meaning of life will be called and will return 42 can also take args in uh, various um, formats. And that the call to the mock meaning a life does return 42, and then we call verify to ensure that the mock did everything that we expected it to do. But I want to plea that you not use this if you don't need it. Um, don't use any mock framework if you don't need it. Because overmocking is evil, and I want this word in your vocabulary. <laughs> What we need to do is we need to mock last. And this needs to be said time and time again, that mock should be the last tool that you grab, the test should already be written, it should already pass, and you only use it to detach it from slow or unstable external resources. If it's fast enough, it's fast enough, don't bother mocking. <coughs> we need to mock high. Don't mock your sockets, mock your readers. Mock your library, not the protocol. Um, the more uh, that you dive down in your mocks, the more you're assuming you're interacting with, and the more you're going to get it wrong. And mock smart. Make sure first that your tests can fail. I don't know how many times that I've ripped a lot of mocks out of tests and prevented bugs from ever being seen because they're self-validated. Um, I see this a lot, and when I say a lot, I see this a lot. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, to quote Phil Hillberg, a now ex member of the CLRB, um, this being the past um, <laughs> Def is my stub framework. Ruby provides you everything you need built into the language to do stubs like that. And in this case, we create a new thing and we override the timestamp method to be in the future, and then you can refute that the object is not done. And then Aaron really wanted me to point out that we should be using the list of substitution principle more in our tests. Now, LSP says that any subclass is a valid replacement for its superclass in all cases. Um, so if we design our code that way, um, we can use that in our tests. And we see here that we have an example, a bullshit example, of an IRC class with a read method. And presumably that's going to read something off the socket and return it back to us. We're going to subclass that with test IRC, and we're going to use that class in our tests. And we override read to simply return a fixed string. And you can then test that the next line method, which is not read, the next line method will return happy because it's properly using read and we're using the subclass. So resist mocks by design. As you can see there, we're able to do that very easily. Um, designs that don't need mocking are always better than designs that do. They're more flexible, they're more testable, they're better, period. Now, we've got something called Minitest Pride, and it's probably out of place, and it's kind of curious that it ships through every one night, but I'm going to allow it because I commit bit. Um, <laughs> it's a simple example of IO pipelining that I wrote on Pride Weekend one year, and all it does is it replaces the dots with colored stars. <laughs> This is the 35 line example of how you can plug into the I.O. system of Minitest and make it do what you want. Um, in this case, we initialize with an I.O. object, we, we hold on to it, we overwrite print, and when we make it print out dots when it gets a dot to print, uh, colored dots, or stars. Um, and actually, initially it was printing out all sorts of Unicode characters, I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, and then everything else hits method missing and passes it on to the I.O. object that we're holding on to. And you can see below, we're setting the output to a wrapper around the old output. And you can pipeline those and pipeline those and pipeline those and make them do whatever you want. So you could use this as a really simple example, uh, a cheat to start off on, plugging this into a GUI or into your IDE. You could use it to emit to growl, the way we used to with uh, auto test, um, or any other notifier. Um, you could use it to record uh, test statistics and record those over time and plot them, whatever you want to do. And finally, my absolute favorite um, is Minitest Benchmark. Uh, here's a very simple example, um, again, bullshit example, for uh, Minitest Unit. And what we have here is we're saying that the performance of this block of code over the domain should be uh, linear to 4 nines performance. Uh, we call obj.algorithm. The benchmark framework takes care of everything else for us. Spec, I should go back and say something. Um, the nice thing is, we simply prefix a method with bench, and it's going to be picked up by the bench framework. Um, we avoid them getting picked up by the bench framework by not requiring uh, the benchmark uh, file. So by wrapping that around in the bench, we're able to have it so that only our CI defines that environment variable. And so our CI is one of our benchmarks so we can have um, benchmark testing over time and consistent results on that. Specting is a little bit different. It's a little bit uglier by two lines. That's because where before we had a nice passive method, here we have an active verb. And so we have to wrap up the verb that may not be defined with the extra check. Um, but otherwise it's exactly the same, um, except that it's in uh, more active language. So what is Benchmark doing? Well, it's running that block of code over a domain. It's gathering the data, and then it's curve fitting that and, and testing that fit against the uh, curve that you said it should be, whether it's linear or exponential or power, doesn't matter. Either you can have a, a test for that and then say whatever it should be. But there's something to say about that. Um, Hardware, memory, 
uh, runtime changes, whether you're running iTunes or not, whatever, are going to cause differences in your test from run to run. So you can't test those values for the specific curve. You shouldn't test those values for the specific curve. You upgrade your RAM, you upgrade your CI uh, server, or you put it out on a, a VM or whatever, it's going to change those values. Well, what it won't change is that. If you test the fit to the curve, you're going to have consistent results over time. So we provide uh, assertions that extend the language of Minitest um, for constant performance, exponential performance, linear power, or a generic sort of performance, and you can write your own fit. We provide similar uh, Minitest spec methods, reverse, um, and you can just go nuts on this. And it's a really wonderful way to test your performance over time. So let's talk for a second about extending. We saw this really awesome example in Bacon's readme. Uh, in Bacon, you can define a lambda that says that a given object should be equal to its reverse. Call it palindrome, and then you can say something as simple as RA should be a palindrome, and you're done. Extending Bacon is beautiful. That's about as good as it gets. In many test unit, it's not that much different. You say a certain palindrome, give it an object, you assert equal to its reverse, and you're done. In many test spec, you can write something very similar to that must be a palindrome, put that up an object, and you say that self must equal self reverse. Or you can use the reflection mechanisms that are used to do all the mirroring of the expectations and simply pull it in from the test side and write one method once. Other examples, uh, simple examples, we have in Ruby gems all over the place because we refactor the tests a lot. We have a cert path exists, refute path exists, we have a cert satisfied by for a certain version and a requirement. Cert resolved for uh, a given set of specs and what it should resolve to. It makes our tests much more readable, much more high level, um, something that a business person can uh, review. So let's talk for a second about the design rationale. I've got just under 12 minutes left, um, hoping to fit all this in. Um, but I, we can skip over some of the numbers if we don't have time. Um, specifically, less is more. I started off very specifically writing this 90 lines of code and making it work for what we needed, making it do nothing more. And it worked great for quite some time, and then I found it. filling it out over time with functionality, realizing that it's not much more, not much more, not much more. And it's still a nice small library um, in comparison to its competitors. Um, and importantly, indirection is the enemy. I want my failures to be at the point of failure. I don't want it to be six miles down the road. I want an exact uh, stack trace. I want to go straight to the problem, and I want to fix it. So let's look at a specific example. A certain delta is what you use to test float equality-ish. You can't test for equality on floats because they're inexact. And all it's doing is it's testing that the difference between the expected value and the actual value is close enough. It's, it's within a certain delta. So you can see here that we test, or uh, we calculate the difference, get the absolute value of that. We defer the calculation of the string until there's an error. And we did that based on numbers because we profiled the tests of all of Ruby core and realized we were spending a lot of time building up those strings for no reason because most of the time they pass. So we wrap that up in a block. It has a helper method to help uh, format the strings, and all that helper method is really doing is concatenating and ensuring that it ends in a period. It's not much uh, much work. And then we're doing a simple assertion because that's all that's needed. It's very straightforward code. You can look at this and at a glance you can know what it is. There's only two methods that need to be understood besides a certain delta itself. That's a certain message, and that's 15 lines of code. Once you've read that, there's no mystery to anything that it's doing. On the other side, n must be close to m, there's nothing to talk about because it's the exact same code, it's fully reused, we already understand it. Now let's look at perhaps my most complex slide. Um, Bacon's example, n should be close to m with the delta, um, is more complex. I'm not expecting you to actually read this code all that much. Um, I've got some call-outs to it. The first thing we do is we say n should, 
and that's going to be instantiating a new shit object. Um, B in this case is a no op. And we wind up calling close on the shit object, which doesn't exist, so we have method missing. That wraps everything up in a satisfy that takes a block that calls send on the original object. And it's not entirely obvious, but the first line of that method missing is putting a question mark on the end of the name of the method that we're calling. So that winds up calling numeric close A. And that's it. It's actually quite equivalent to what we're doing. The really neat thing about this is, despite this extra complexity over my previous example, is that once you understand this, you understand almost all of Bacon. Bacon's only 300 lines long, <coughs> and that's including all the extensions like uh, numeric close and it's done. You now understand Bacon. Uh, it's, it's a really pretty framework, and you should look at it. Um, and there's only seven methods to be understood in this example. Uh, it's about 50 lines of code total, and once you do that, the mechanism's there, it just makes sense. Um, so there's a top level describe, the it, should, um, be, satisfy, method missing, and close A, and then that's everything. Uh, in order to get other um, equivalencies, or expectations, uh, you just have to go study their implementations, and you're done, because it all goes to the same mechanism. In comparison, Certain delta and test unit one is a bit of a mess. Um, I don't want you to read this. Uh, more look at the shape. Um, we have everything wrapped up in a wrap assertion. It's not really clear why. And we have a lot of work being done iterating over a hash of only three items with only three lines of the code. Um, a lot of work is being done building up that message, calling build message, and if you trace that kind of down, you realize there's an entire templating system in testing. And then we have this assert block, despite an assert operator. We have an assert block that does something fairly cool. operator. Um, and I'm not going to trace that. It, it's gross. All in all, there's about 160 lines of code that you need to understand this one assertion. Um, and I'm not going to call those out either. Version 2, which is a gem that you can use uh, in 1.8 or 1.9, is refactored and cleaned up by a lot. But once you start looking into those refactorings, you realize that they've actually doubled in size, and it's quite a bit uglier. Um, but the top level method is a lot more readable, and I think that's worth calling out. I think that's important. Um, I don't like this level of complexity. Here's how I would have written it. You don't need a hash of the when you only have three lines in the first place. So I would just simply do three respond to, assert respond to's, um, followed by the operator respond to, and um, finally do my work using assert operator because it builds up a proper message for you. Done. When you do it this way, there's only 50 lines of code to understand. It's a lot more straightforward, and it's a lot more performant. Finally, our spec N should be close to M. <laughs> I wasn't smart enough to figure it out. Um, I spent about two hours trying to trace through the code, and the levels of indirection are so vast that I give up. And I would love to sit down with someone later today if they can walk me through it, but really I flip my bows a bit and I'm done. Um, so I think we actually have time. So I'm going to go over some test framework comparisons. After you've seen the code, this makes a little more sense. Um, Bacon and Minitest are very performant. They're very similar in performance. Um, they're very similar in size once you realize that Minitest has three frameworks. Um, and Cucumber is always on the bottom line of these charts. Always. So if we take the multiple column for the positive assertions, and plot it, it looks like this. And I think that's a better visualization. With bacon being one unit, and bacon is always a unit, <laughs> you can see that many test and test unit one um, are almost entirely equivalent on performance here. And this is uh, performance against running a thousand tests with a uh, simple assertion each one. Um, and then it very quickly gets much slower. Very quickly. This is where you spend your time every day when you're doing your iterations. 
If we look at the number of lines of code executed on a simple single line test, you can see that many test unit and spec are very, very low. I mean, why it's 400 and more for the specs, I don't know. I'll have to look into that. And the simpler frameworks are near the, the <coughs> model or smallest. What's interesting is that Bacon is doing a lot more work than I am. And it's actually performing about the same. I need to look into those um, performance benefits and see what he's doing, besides the fact that he really doesn't have a runner. He executes the test as soon as they get parsed. Um, and then our spec is the second worst, and Cucumber is by far the worst. Startup time. This is where we're really spending our time on the durations. This is how long it takes just to get up and running. Again, test unit one, which cheats a little bit, because it ships with Ruby 1.8, and it bypasses uh, Ruby gems. Uh, it's a little bit more performant on that. Followed by Bacon, many test, should have. Um, test unit two, our spec two is way out there. And then Cucumber is just ridiculous. Lines of code, including their dependencies. I'm not even counting the lines of code that I found yesterday. Um, <laughs> there's just a lot of stuff there in Cucumber and our spec two, and it's something that you need to parse and execute every single time you fire your tests. And finally, flog. You can see that there's an absolute correlation here between the number of lines of code and how much it's executing on a single test and the flog. Um, the complexity of Bacon and the complexity of any test are just nearly on the floor, and everyone else is just going through the roof. And that's still not counting the C. So, to wrap up, I, I think the numbers speak for themselves. You need to think about where you're spending your time where your company is spending their money, because every man hour spent waiting for this stuff is wasted. Um, but I'll let you figure that out on your own and what's appropriate for you. Uh, all this is really important to me, but I think that if you can take anything from this talk, um, number one thing that you can do to improve your life is not technology, um, but there's no conferences on this topic. Um, please stop using pre-ground versions. <laughs> <laughs> Fresh ground pepper is vastly better and it's cheap. We're about four blocks away from a place called World Spice, which you may have seen on Good Eats. Um, it's an excellent place and you should check it out later today. Uh, it's right below Pike Place Market. Uh, and finally, uh, special thanks to Gregory Brown Woo! and to my foster kittens. <laughs> um, they kept me sane during the Ruby Gems drama over the last couple of months. And without them, I probably wouldn't be here.